In my opinion, people are the second most important thing. Born in 1985, CEO and co-founder of Bending Spoons, a company that became known to the general public because of the Immuni app they developed, but is actually an amazing company for a lot of other things. My favorite? The fact that they acquired Evernote this year. Who knows what I'm talking about? You know it's crazy. Evernote is a Silicon Valley app. Bending Spoons is an Italian company based in Milan. They acquired Evernote this year. It's really nonsensical as a thing. But not only that, also the fact that they are a company that makes hundreds of millions with a really scary operating profit. Their budgets are the most beautiful I have ever seen in my life. With sales rising from 9 million in 2017 to 109 million in 2021. Bending Spoons is not sponsoring this video. In fact, I am the one who had to convince them to do this interview under the advice of Paolo Denadai and Davide Dattoli, whom I interviewed some time ago. They were enlightening and recommended that I interview Luca Ferrari because according to them, he is just as enlightening. And so he was. Oh, and I forgot to mention, both Paolo Denadai and Davide Dattoli are investors in Bending Spoons, along with Ryan Reynolds and the former CEO of Google. I mentioned her the most famous, The Weeknd, Alex Pale and Andrew. Andrew Haggard of The Chainsmokers, Ryan Reynolds, Bradley Cooper, the director, award-winning Chloe Zhao, are the members of Dude Perfect, Mythical, the former of Google, Eric Schmidt, and then also Fedez. Luca Ferrari is not the sole founder and partner of Bending Spoons, but he is one of four operating partners at the moment, although there are five founders. He and Matteo Danieli, another co-founder, have already done an interview with Fedez in the Wolf podcast, and that's why I didn't want to ask him the same questions, because I had seen the podcast. I want to ask the questions that I'm interested in. So now I'm going to tell you all the things you need to know to understand the interview that I will then do with Luca. Luca Ferrari and Matteo did an undergraduate course in Padua, won a scholarship to go to Copenhagen, where there they also met with a third partner, with whom upon graduation, they created the Evertail app in 2011. This app raised 500,000 euros, not bad, but it still failed because they were first timers, because they didn't do thorough market research, and as often happens, it didn't work. But they didn't give up, and with two other people who were working in Evertail, together they founded Bending Spoons in 2013, with the goal not to become a particular app, but to create a team, a machine that could make any app work. But let's fast forward to 2016, and they end up with a fitness app, 30 Days of Fitness, which turns over tens of millions and is one of the most profitable in the world. And shortly after that, another success, Splice, a mobile video editing app, which became the number one mobile editing app by revenue. And then after that, Remini, an app that I also use, which is an app that uses artificial intelligence to focus photos, enhance them, make them more detailed, do upscaling, and a whole other set of things. I use it, I didn't know it was theirs. One really interesting thing is that, unlike their first startup with bending spoons, they never diluted capital to raise investment. It's a common thing, when a startup is born, they generally know that they need a lot of money to grow, and they won't be able to make money for a number of years. So it happened to Amazon, which waited years before becoming profitable. So also with Uber, so also with Google. But that is not the case with Bending Spoons, which even if we call it a startup, was making money from day zero. And that's why it never had to dilute equity. But to raise money, it simply, quote unquote, went into debt. So instead of going to an investor to sell a piece of the company, it went to a bank to borrow money, clearly where I would then go and give back in return. That's something you can only afford to do if you're already profitable, clearly. Other Otherwise, you would have nothing to give back. And that's what makes Bending Spoons special. The fact that they were able to grow so fast, scale so quickly, without diluting capital. In my opinion, there are a lot of other interesting things as well. So with this information, and with a lot of questions to ask, I showed up in Corso Como, under the offices of Bending Spoons, which are on the 4th, 5th and 6th floors of a building. And the first thing I did was to take a tour of all the offices. Here we are, these are our offices. On the third floor is the reception, with halls, meetings and offices. The rooms take the names of places in the world. This one is called Shara. Then we have Krakatoa, we have Everest. They are very nice, they are not normal offices, but they are designed to be very cozy. There is a common area where you can play PlayStation. There are foosball tables. It also serves as a cafeteria. There is also a beer tapper. At the end of a day's work, beer. I thought it was a mirror. From inside you can see everything, but from outside you can't. Going up to the fifth floor, there is an open space. There are other meeting rooms named after animals that work well in teams, in groups. Ant and lion. And then on the sixth floor, we have other rooms and other open spaces, even special rooms. Here is another little room called Manga. As you can clearly see, one of the prettiest rooms on this floor is called Space. I don't know what you can see from this porthole. There are all stars on the ceiling, though. We have standing desks for when you want to change positions a little bit. And here we have the supervisory on our future office. We're not going to move every once in a while. It's literally across the street. The plants are all real. 
and here is another small kitchen, like on every floor. The offices are so beautiful and well thought out because Bending Spoons puts so much emphasis on wellness in the workplace. So much so, in fact, that it is always at the top of the list of the best places to work. It's really a strategy because, especially for software development companies, having better employees is a key asset. It is an advantage over others. So, all along, the megatech companies like Google and all the others have been focusing so much on employee welfare to get an edge and hire the best people. After the tour, I went to a meeting room where I was greeted by croissants and juice, and then Luca arrived, ready to be interviewed. How do you manage your time? Because when you called me, you had projected five minutes, and it was five minutes exactly. All part from realizing that time is one of the most precious resources limited, it is not expandable. I would say there are two maybe tips that have come. The first is to plan ahead, so don't live by the day. I, every two weeks, on Sunday afternoon, I spend two or three hours deciding exactly as much as possible at that time what I'm going to do in the next two weeks that I have. The second very important thing is to have the courage to say no to a lot of things. One thing that tends to be difficult is saying no to people. Already here, he told me something very interesting, which is to have the courage to say no to things. As you know, I ask these questions because, first of all, they interest me, because I want to learn as a small business owner. And it always pleases me when the things that more seasoned entrepreneurs than me tell me are exactly the things that I find in my own life. And saying no is perhaps one of the biggest challenges I'm trying to overcome in this 2023. At the tool level, do you use calendars or special things? I tried a lot of them. Finally, I went back to the basics and I use Apple Notes, which is really simple, so a bulleted list, and then Google Calendar. One of the important points is you have to plan your whole life in the same place. Do you have a personal assistant? I have a person who helps me, not in my personal organization though, he helps me with some projects. For example, if I have to go on a business trip, maybe he helps me with travel arrangements. But I am the one who stands there and decides exactly what I do here. You mentioned personal and work time. How do you manage these two things? It means that of personal time, I have little or no time. Do you work after dinner? For the last couple of years, no. It tends to happen like yesterday I finished moonlighting at night, but normally I get off around 9 o'clock. What about Sunday? Yes, no, I work seven days a week, seven days out of seven, 365 days a year, except maybe Christmas. For Christmas, I am not one for celebration. However, maybe I go on vacation with friends, girlfriend. Here you are almost 400 right now, is that right? Yes, that's right. In my opinion, only those who are called Spooners, the people we hired, yes, because of some acquisitions, we are also 500. Having 500 employees is different from having five employees. And while well now, I know perfectly well what it is like to have a small company like mine. I have no idea what the tasks of a CEO managing 500 people are. So I wanted to know in detail what his tasks are, the things he does during the day. In my opinion, it is important to stay hands on here and there. Otherwise, you lose the skills that help you then help others. Do you still have to speak the language of the developer, of the project manager? At least some things. How much of your work is inward? So internal communications, management system, and how much outward? Clients, projects, products? 90% internal. We don't have customers, companies who ask for so some direct interaction. We have consumer customers. Instead, the things I used to do externally are discussions with investors or possible new investors, banks, because maybe we raise loans for these operations. Very little. But still, I do get activities, uh, let's say publishing stocks like this talk we are having, which I would say no more than a couple of hours a month. Maybe I go to some conferences, I try to limit it. I find it quite time consuming. So the bulk of the time, however, the energies are devoted precisely internally to the management system. Are there any techniques that you have learned? What in the jargon is called deliberate practice, so a practice. Doing things, but not doing them so like a zombie, but doing them and then asking yourself questions about how you did them, how you could have done them better, asking your colleagues, what is it that I did good? What is it that I did not do so well? I really read a lot, books, but also other forms of content to try to understand, so also new ideas to apply. Then I don't know if I'm good at what I do, however, I'm definitely better at it than when I started. How much time do you spend reading? I would say a good hour a day. Of the things you read about management, is there a particular book or technique or lesson that you say, this is my beacon, my way of being a manager? Look, the probably the most high level but perhaps most valuable advice I can give is frequently to ask yourself the question, what manager would I want if I were the one who had to work with this manager? One mistake people often make is forgetting that there is a human being on the other side, so trying to be the person who is nice to work with, ambitious, demanding, but fair. In the first person, she works her butt off so much that she tries to give you critical advice, who says bravo when you've done a good thing, who apologizes when you've done wrong, who acknowledges credit, who doesn't try to take credit that is yours. Every two or three months we welcome questions, one can ask them anonymously, and then we have a session all together in plenary. They are tough as questions, some, aren't they? Some. 
And then we also shared a written version anyway, even upon arrival at the recording. So we really believe in transparency, in listening to everybody's voices. It doesn't mean always doing what you are asked to do, also because in 400 U there is not one thing where everybody agrees. It means honestly listening to criticism, advice and taking it seriously. Do you do one-to-one? -one? I do one-to-one -one with more or less 12, 15 people who work a little bit more closely with me. I think it's a good tool to kind of institutionalize the okay a little bit. Let's sit down at least once every two weeks and tell each other how things have been going, what goals we have, ask each other how are you doing, what can I do to help you. The important thing is to prepare it well though. There is occasionally a chat. In my opinion, it is also good for you. However, better not. There has to be a clear agreement for either or both parties. I have a set of questions or topics that I would like to discuss. However, then I myself share my goals with them in written form so they can give me feedback. Have you ever gotten negative feedback? Well, yes, so many... Okay, okay, going back to productivity. Now that there are so many of you, how much impact do you think your personal productivity has on the company? A decision made a little better can impact the company's trattoria so much. If I am slow to respond or am less proactive, it weighs. So, to recap, the bulk of his work is internal and management in managing people and making strategic decisions about the company's progress. So, although there are many, he still plays a key role on the company's progress. He can't talk to everybody, but he has more or less 12-15 reports with whom he discusses all issues. A very difficult decision you had to make in the last year? There are always many. One kind of decision that is always very painful is when a person after evaluating for a long time, trying maybe, giving feedback, does not seem to contribute to the standards we set for ourselves internally. Because for me, we are all people with empathy and we bond a lot with each other. It is always very difficult to let the person go. Another difficult decision was when we looked at a possible non-Evernote acquisition. We really liked it, but we went really deep into it and in the end we decided not to do it. When you get these choices that you know can really shift your trajectory so much, there is no clear yes or clear no, they can be extremely painful. Again, among the most difficult things he had to do, he mentioned layoffs. Firing a person, from what I'm hearing, of all the entrepreneurs I hear, is really one of the hardest things. One particular thing about Bending Spoons is that there are four founders. And if we go and look at the balance sheets, they started out equally in the ownership of the company. And it's notoriously difficult to run a company when there are so many partners. It always scares me to have so many partners. If there's a reason why a company fails, either it's because it runs out of money at the beginning, or it's because the partners fight. Generally, how did you handle the relationship between partners? And especially also the division of duties and responsibilities? It's a trade-off, of course. More people bring more skills, give you a better chance of succeeding. On the other hand, the risk of a quarrel is higher. Fortunately, with two of these other four partners, I had been friends for several years, then surprises can always come. The other two had been with us in the previous startup that failed. They had both distinguished themselves. It is very difficult. Regarding, however, the division of roles. For example, you are now CEO. How did you divide them up? But look, and on we the always did what? what needed to be done. We even didn't even identify a CEO for even years in the beginning because we didn't need one. I simply did what needed to be done. The other four did what needed to be done based of us also their own capabilities, of course. Then later we decided to identify the roles a little more formally and clearly because when you grow up and start having more relationships with the outside world, there is incredible confusion if there are no labels. But I, like the others, we are all people who, if you tell me that for the next five years I have to just mop the floor and that's what the company needs, I do it serenely. Were there verticals? Someone stronger on coding, someone on finance. The partner who then came out a few years ago, he is a designer, so he did the design. Uh, then two of us, four others, had pretty strong software development skills. Me and the other one learned in bending spoons. So at first we all programmed except the designer. Then after that, the first ones to stop programming were the two of us because we had less experience, less skills, so it was more efficient to do it that way. My partner Francesco is very passionate and very good at data analysis, so he was involved in marketing from the beginning. We do data-driven marketing. He has always been the person at the forefront of acquisitions because precisely acquisitions, again, require a lot of data analysis and waiting on data. I've been doing a lot of corporate culture, selection process in general, so creating teams. It's something I didn't think about, but I was so passionate about it to the point that for so many years I spent more than half my time on recruiting. This, in my opinion, is a very important issue. With all the entrepreneurs I interview, I get the impression that they always tell me that hiring is perhaps the most important thing. In your opinion, what was the right strategy? 
First and foremost, I will establish a foundational belief. In my perspective, people are the second most crucial aspect. However, without a successful strategy in place, no team can maintain coherence. It is essential to have a clear direction that is logical and sensible. In my viewpoint, there were two critical matters we addressed related to hiring and team performance. The initial point revolves around our sheer dedication to these aspects. At the time when our team consisted of 50 individuals, I estimate that roughly 10 of them were solely focused on recruitment. This, in my opinion, is completely below the acceptable standard. Did you have any parameters? Here is my attempt at reformulating the text while targeting approximately 1,006 characters. Moving on to the next point, I would like to discuss our approach towards evaluating individuals. In my perspective, we excelled in our ability to be extremely rational in this process. We came to realize that experience was of relatively minor importance when compared to core talents in the various roles we had to fill. Hence, we made a conscious effort to focus on finding individuals who were highly inexperienced but possessed exceptional learning skills and a drive to excel. Our aim was to create an environment where these individuals could truly thrive and develop their abilities. Additionally, we recognized that certain conventional methods such as interviews were proving to be ineffective. Therefore, we minimized the number of interviews and opted for a structured approach, relying heavily on practical tests to provide us with an accurate evaluation of the candidate's suitability for the job. Here he said something fundamental hiring is the second most important thing because the first clearly is having a business model that works. Bending Spoons first found an effective business model and then, in order to scale it, clearly needed hundreds of employees. Especially in app development, it's critical to find the right resources and that's why, early on, they were aware that hiring the right people and internal management, it was a crucial factor in continuing to grow and that would determine the success of the company. And that's why they invest so much money in corporate travel and benefits. All of this works if you have a business model that allows you to be even slightly inefficient with the budget. Could it be? Yes in the sense that it is a virtuous or vicious circle depending on which path you take. Clearly, the more you engage in hiring well, the better the hacienda will go and the more resources you have to hire well. My advice is that always everyone should be frugal. Are you frugal? Are you not at Google spend a lot? Surely we want to be frugal. We try to avoid waste at all. There are expenses that... They look like mirrors. While substantial in our opinion, they are efficient. One, for example, is every year we all go on a week-long corporate retreat, completely expensed to very beautiful exotic places. The expense is considerable. Generally, it is around 4,500 euros per person, so it is no small thing. We feel that the value there is of further team spirit, getting to know colleagues, the good memories that are formed all together in the end are worth that investment and allow us to make the workplaces here even better. So, in my opinion, to do that is still to be frugal. Remote work, yes or no? We've always supported it, I would say, virtually without limit. I'm a fan of the option to work remotely. I myself work from home most of the time. On the other hand, I think where you can spend enough time in the office, it's good and right because it allows you to achieve a level of knowledge of immersion colleagues in the corporate environment that is difficult to replicate remotely. At this point, I asked how they got to bill hundreds of millions, starting with only 40,000. Initially, in 2010, our first startup was focused solely on the mobile industry. By 2013, it began to operate smoothly. We did not achieve overnight success, but rather the result of 10 years of consistent hard work. In June, we celebrated our 10-year anniversary, reflecting on our substantial and consistent growth over the years. We never experienced drastic fluctuations in our business performance, where one year was extremely successful, while the next was disappointing. In 2013, we made the decision to pursue several reasons. Firstly, we were confident in the immense growth potential of the mobile app market, which ultimately proved to be true. Secondly, there was a low barrier to entry, requiring minimal capital investment. Thankfully, we still had around 40,000 euros remaining from our previous startups, albeit not enough to compete with a company like Tesla. We also didn't anticipate being able to secure additional funding as we were recovering from a bankruptcy. Furthermore, during that time, raising capital in Italy was incredibly challenging. Lastly, we were eager to implement a distinctly innovative strategy, which I will elaborate upon briefly. However, due to its unconventional nature, it required us to dedicate a considerable amount of time to prove its feasibility. Unlike any existing model, it was difficult for venture capitalists to fully comprehend its potential. Couldn't you have said we are the equivalent of the American one, but in Italy... Our our strategy was essentially to build a platform from technology skills, talents optimized to develop scale up digital technology products. So while almost all startups say we make this product, we build the machine that makes the product and then instead of making the product launch the product from scratch, typically we look at the marketplace products that have already proven that there is interest, have already maybe built competitive advantages, maybe a user base, a significant user base, maybe a good positioning in a distribution channel but are made not at their best. And you acquire them if they get acquired. Precisely, typically it's a win-win situation because our offering tends to be very good for them as well. And then we make an incredible leap in quality to this product generally by rewriting the whole software, redesigning the whole user experience, the user interface, the monetization, the marketing. So it's as if we made it from scratch ourselves. Summary. 
The strategy of the bending spoons is to acquire apps that for some reason don't work but are in a good market, restructure them, make them work, and make a bundle of money. Initially, they bought small apps with little money, pulling more money out of them, and then over time they scaled up super fast, going from buying the first app for $10,000 to buying Evernote for hundreds of millions. Initially, you couldn't buy? No, no, initially we could, thought in 2014 already. So six, seven months after we started, we made the first acquisition and we got there like this. The first two or three apps we launched from scratch, very simple apps. The first one was called Fonzie, an app made in two weeks, a triviality, and we made 10,000 euros. But what was that? It was really a basic thing. You would put some text and he would turn it into some different fonts for you, but just rudimentary stuff. Now, by the way, we have an ultra sophisticated app that does a similar thing. But even there, my partner Luca and I did it in two weeks. Okay, it was a game. With that 10,000 euros, we go to pay the rent for a few months, little more anyway. We struggle to get users, even though a little something with that app we have gained. And then during a brainstorming to say, but how the heck do we do that? This competitor gets all these users. And the idea of one of us is let's acquire him. He has the users and we think we can make a better product. How much did you have to acquire it? Uh, first, we paid him $10,000. Okay, so little stuff. Very little. However, you put in 10,000 and take out 20,000, put in 20,000 and take out 40,000. Years go by and you grow. Do you then resell them or close the apps? What happens? We have never, except for one case of a small thing, resold anything. We keep them and manage them as long as working on them brings turnover and we can significantly improve the product revenues in short something tangible. We continue to work on them. If at a certain point we see that the product really has reached saturation, now you can't do anything more and they don't come to us anymore, we keep it but with minimal intervention so that it continues to work well, but we don't go to add new content. Then if a product at a certain point really few users, we close it. Two important questions. The first is, you have only taken on debt to date to finance yourself. How come? How do you do it? Generally, debt costs you less than equity because an investor expects eventually quite high returns, especially in a startup phase, maybe even 20% and more per year. Whereas when you can afford to raise debt because you have to be profitable AI, otherwise the banks won't give it to you and prove you can pay it back. Generally, rates vary, but not by much. And lately, they are also low. Were rates low in 2013? Wasn't particularly favorable, but still, if it had been even 5%, it would have changed almost nothing because we would borrow that capital there, maybe at 5% for simplicity, but then we would get 50% returns on it, so it makes little difference whether it's 2% or 5%. Did you shit yourself when you got 100 million in debt? Because still, on the one hand, you know it's a valid business model, you know you're scaling, etc., etc. On the other hand, you never know, do you? 100%. Not so much there. Let's say I've always been terrified of disappointing the people who believe in me, including those who trust and lend you money. I have to say that by dint of feeling the weight of this responsibility a little bit, you either die or you adapt to a certain point. So you get a little bit of a skin in the game and you realize that in the end, the only thing you can do is to give 100% of what you have in you and then be honest. And then if you fail, what more could you do? The thing that weighs most on my mind actually is not so much the 100 million in the bank, which we take extreme care of. Absolutely. But the fact that almost all of our colleagues, the Spooners, have invested because the way bending spoons works, you have your pay that you can receive all in classic money, or you can also choose to receive some of it, even most of it in equity from bending spoons. Our colleagues, almost all of them then, have invested in a very pushy way as well. On the basis of what business valuation is this done? If one is not listed, how is it done? We do a new internment every six months. If there was maybe an investment has happened in 2019 and 2021, post-harvest, we go to see the valuation at which investors came in. Then the Spooners have a discount because we think it's better, assuming they care to invest both for the Spooner and for bending the spoons in general if there is this participation. Again summarizing, even though Bending Spoons has never done capital increase, it has allowed its employees to receive their salary in equity, so in ownership of the company, in shares, I guess because the salary of developers is often also very high and they can afford it. But also because in many employees, knowing that the company is doing well, they have an incentive to want a little piece of it, and they also have an incentive to stay in it and work. Bringing in investors was also an opportunity for all the people within Bending Spoons to sell some of its shares and make a little bit of money. Then if in addition the investors that come in are fantastic and strategic, it's a win-win situation. Question you must have been asked in 10,000 instead is, how come in Italy, in the sense that a company with your very nice balance sheet should be in Silicon Valley? We would like to unhinge that a company like that should be in Silicon Valley. We started in Copenhagen, then we decided to post bending spoons in Italy in 2014 with the idea that if someone had succeeded in creating a global tech company with roots in a country like ours, we would have added that little piece that a country like Italy lacks to have an economic and cultural revolution, and that is role models, inspirational examples. What's missing is someone who has made it that makes you say fuck, but then it can be done. You never found that being in Italy penalized you. Maybe it just lacks a thriving environment to deal with. With. And the second thing is taxes. How does that work? 
Certainly the network is much more limited in Italy was one of the limitations we found is not having as many mentors, almost no mentors. Now it is easier to... You have bought Evernote. We have relationships with a lot of very competent people who give us so much advice and so much criticism. However, for many years, it was not like that. On the other hand, the blanket is always short. Silicon Valley has its great advantages, but in my opinion, a good entrepreneur identifies where the advantages are more than the disadvantages, especially where the result is higher. The talk about taxes is a little bit all true in the sense that taxes in Italy are very high as far as workers are concerned, so the cost of labor is very high. That is, you hire a person, you go give a gross salary of 60,000 euros, you have to pay another 20, 25,000 between contributions. So in general, the amount of taxes at, let's say, net parity in Italy is one of the highest in the world. On the other hand, taxes on corporate profits are in the end quite in line with most countries. They are not particularly penalizing. Certainly there are more efficient countries, but in my opinion, in general, I think contributing by paying taxes is a good and right thing in general. You said there was a lack of mentors. Were there people you know or don't know, or are authors who inspired or guided you in the growth of the company? Maybe four names that I really like. One is Benjamin Franklin, who is an entrepreneur in Mike and other things. Another one is Warren Buffett, famous investor, probably of modern entrepreneurs. I would say Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. What would you do if you were to start now? What market would you go to? We're actually working on it with a little exploration project with a nice team that has been very busy called Humami. An area where there's an opportunity to create very big value and have a big impact is in the area of food. Would you enter the food market? A very difficult market. It is a huge our old market mostly. There is room in my opinion to build something really enlightened. Doing these interviews will be really interesting. If I do these videos, it's because I, in the first place, I am stimulated to do these interviews and I use the videos to tell you what I learn. And I have to say, getting to know Benny Spoons has been really interesting, especially knowing that in Italy, despite all the problems we have, despite the absurd taxes, it's possible to make a company that has really crazy results like Benny Spoons. It's not easy, but it's possible.